evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. Hello, coming up, a fish thought to have been extinct for nearly 60 million years has been caught and so declared a living fossil. History has been in the making since time immemorial, but arguably the most exciting time was when spaceflight captured the imagination of the world. We take you back to 1959 and NASA's very first series of manned flights. A safe water supply is vital to life. Yet over a billion people in the world are daily forced to walk long distances to often polluted water sources for their needs. Researchers have designed a drill for use in rural Africa which can reduce tenfold the cost of constructing a well. Scientists are helping to reconstruct a portrait of the Earth the way it was four billion years ago. They believe that instead of the Earth's surface being a boiling ocean of magma, the early Earth was cool enough to have water, continents and conditions that could even support life. They reached their conclusions by reading the telltale chemical structure of a zircon crystal, one of the world's oldest known materials. And British designers have taken a step into the future by creating the world's biggest and most advanced robotic dog. These refrigerated cases contain human tissue that's been donated by relatives after the death of a loved one. This particular tissue can't be used in transplantation operations to replace someone's damaged kidney or heart, for instance, but it can be of great value to medical researchers such as cell biologists and toxicologists who look at the risks associated with taking drugs and research basic medical and biological problems. One such problem is finding out how new drugs will affect us. Animal studies are all very well, but only by studying a drug's action on human liver enzymes, for example, can its effect in humans be accurately predicted. The donation of this human tissue is fraught with ethical dilemmas, and the Human Tissue Bank works within a strict ethical framework. There must be anonymity concerning the donor, the donor's family, the hospital source, and it must be a strictly non-profit service. The tissue bank is available for use by approved biomedical research programs. It's hoped to encourage more people to think of donating their organs after death for such medical research which should reduce and refine the need for animal experiments. The Kenya National Museums in the Kenyan capital Nairobi is now home to a living fossil, an adult coelacanth, which was captured off the Kenyan coast of Malindi early 2001. Many scientists have thought the coelacanth was extinct 60 million years ago. They were wrong. They now call it a living fossil. The coelacanths are indeed members of a primitive group of fishes that have been in existence for 400 million years. The capture of the fish, which weighs 77 kilograms, was received with a lot of surprise by itch ecology worldwide and fish lovers around the world. This fish was captured by accident off the shores of Malindi. During its capture, the fishermen who could not believe their catch said it behaved very aggressively and they retained it because of its uniqueness. It was so named because of the spines that project from the vertebrae to the caudal fin rays. An adult coelacanth can grow at least to 180 centimetres in length and weigh 98 kilograms. This one is slightly over 150 centimetres and weighs 77 kilograms. Its age has been estimated between 10 and 20 years. A skull in two parts allows up and down movements between them. A strong pair of muscles beneath the skull's base lowers the front half of the skull, giving the coelacanth a powerful bite. It's the only living animal with that structure. 
Meanwhile, back on the seas, who knows what peculiar catch the fishermen might land in the future. Scooping water from a hand dug well and trekking miles with it back to the village. It's a daily chore for millions in Africa, yet clean water is often to be found only a few meters underground. The problem is getting the water out. Drilling a well can cost up to 10,000 pounds sterling. This newly developed hand operated hammer drill can sink a well in Africa at a tenth of that price. Members of a research team at Cranfield University just outside London designed the new tool. The project is trying to develop new technology, but in particular it's trying to get that technology taken up by small drilling contractors, small businesses in Africa who can provide water for rural communities, schools and hospitals. As the pipe is hammered through rock, clay and sand to the water below, new sections can be screwed on. All parts of the rig except the super hard drill bit are designed to be made or bought locally removing the need for costly imported spares. And there's no patent on the design. The designers have published in full all the drawings and specifications of the rig so that local manufacturers can take it on board. It might take two weeks to drill the well depending on the depth of the water table. Then a simple hand pump like this can be fitted to provide a permanent water supply to the village. The designers hope the rig will be taken up by small contractors who can make a business out of drilling wells for communities and then in turn produce water sources at a cost that people can afford, thereby freeing up money from communities instead of leaving them dependent on outside aid organisations. Imagine a time, not so long ago, where spaceflight not only captured the imagination of a nation, but also the aspirations and ideals of the whole world. A time when the world's press could report no bigger story than that of Project Mercury, NASA's very first series of manned spaceflights. The story began in Washington at a press conference in 1959. It was a Jules Verne kind of story, a story that made front page news and became a focus of scientific and creative energies. The Cape, as Cape Canaveral was known to reporters, became one of the most prized datelines in journalism. Downrange from the Cape, south of Bermuda, the recovery forces stood steady. Radio and television carried the event as it happened. Astronaut Alan Shepard was leaving Earth. The analysis of the historic event made the pages of every major news publication. Sadly, unlike today, the manning of a mission into space was an event that national leaders marked with celebration and ceremony. Very proud of him, and I speak on behalf of uh, the Vice President, who is Chairman of our Space Council, and who bears great responsibilities in this field, the members of the House and Senate Space Committee who are with us today, and uh, this decoration which has gone from the ground up here. <laughs> It seemed that no sooner had the ink dried on the story of one successful mission than reporters started covering the next. It was indeed a time of great fascination and expectation as one astronaut and then the next was pulled from the waters of the North Atlantic.
Here, the helicopter was experiencing engine difficulties. A distance behind the ailing helicopter, astronaut Grisham can be seen waiting patiently in the water. Eventually, of course, Grisham was winched to safety. Before long, the world's press was covering the story of NASA's first attempt to put a man into orbit around the Earth. The great honor and responsibility fell upon the shoulders of one John Glenn. The world caught its breath as the countdown for the flight was halted midstream. Technical difficulties delayed the flight. John Glenn was not to orbit that day. But it would not be a long wait for the press before the countdown was reinitiated at Cape Canaveral. Once more, the world waited. Uh, they walked over to the van, uh, which would take them out to pad 16. At 4.25, he began crawling into his spacesuit. One last bit of human contact before Glenn was to be propelled into the unknown. The world witnessed the enormity of the undertaking. And the recovery teams were at the ready. This time, all systems reported go, and the mission started with a roar. All their eyes were focused on the rocket. There were delays, but when it came, it was exactly as everyone had planned. Been installed here at the press site for them to tell their story to the world. To their own Media crews at the time, much like today, relied heavily on NASA's visual aids to inform viewers of exactly what was happening. When the Navy finally came upon Glenn's escape pod, the world waited in anticipation to hear that he was alive and well. He is reported to be a hero. And there he was, not only alive and well, but more cheerful for the experience. The first manned orbital flight. U.S. astronaut John Glenn is on the deck. He's reported to be a hale and hearty astronaut. At the hands of the international press, John Glenn became somewhat of an international hero. The ticker tape parades that followed were the biggest and the most spirited many had ever witnessed. And naturally, the press was there for every moment of a hero's welcome home. Space exploration, however, could not measure its success with a single victory. The next missions were already underway. When astronaut Scott Carpenter gave the OK, all systems were go for another enthralling orbital flight. Loud and clear, Jose. Don't buy too much. Oh. Everything went well, but then an unexpected event. The capsule overshot the expected landing area. Communications failed, and for 35 minutes there was no word. The final news couldn't have been received by a more expectant audience. Carpenter had been found. After a post-flight examination, Scott Carpenter returned to Cape Canaveral and a celebration enjoyed by family, press and NASA officials alike. Soon the world was to witness the fifth ever manned space flight and only the third ever orbital flight. The members of the world's press were kept at a distance as the distinctly silver Atlas rocket took off. Within minutes of the takeoff, stories and pictures were transmitted by the wire services. They appeared on page one of the daily newspapers of the world and took center stage in televised reports. 
Before returning to Earth, the mission took important footage of cloud coverage and land masses. Recovery efforts were no half-hearted affair. This is the Mercury News Center. It acted as the contact point for the world's media representatives. It was here that questions were answered, interviews were arranged, and news briefings and press conferences took place. In order to cover every phase of Project Mercury, the press, wire services, TV and radio networks pooled their resources and personnel. It was without doubt the most intriguing and exciting story of its time. And the time soon came that NASA's sixth astronaut, Gordon Cooper, was ready to be launched out of the atmosphere and into orbit. And as journalists were reporting all systems go, so too were NASA's technicians giving a clean bill of health to the flight that was about to take place. The news teams of over 25 countries gathered at the press compound located some three kilometers from ground zero. Despite recent successes, it was still a tense moment for the astronaut, the technicians and the media equally. For the first time, an astronaut was communicating directly with technicians on Earth. But some of the news wasn't good. The inverters which supplied electrical power to his craft's automatic attitude control system were failing. This meant the astronaut had to bring his capsule back to Earth under manual control. Literally millions of viewers and listeners around the world could only hope for Cooper's craft to splash down safely. Rescue teams were put on immediate high alert. Naval vessels located the escape pod on radar, but no one knew the fate of the astronaut within. The helicopter dropped rescuers into the waters around the pod. The remains of the rocket were then brought safely aboard the rescue ship. The swimmers reported that astronaut Cooper was conscious and in good spirits inside. Without doubt, it was successfully overcoming missions with difficulties, much like Cooper's short Earth orbit that saw man's ventures into space evolve into what they are today. Without ingenuity and the interest generated by the world's press, our adventures in space would remain only dreams. Scientists at the University of Edinburgh, working with scientists from the United States and Australia, are helping to reconstruct a portrait of the Earth the way it was four billion years ago. Their findings have attracted international attention, the new research creating a world radically different from the one previously imagined. They believe that instead of the Earth's surface being a boiling ocean of magma, the early Earth was cool enough to have water, continents and conditions that could even support life. This is a zircon crystal. The team reached their conclusions by reading the telltale chemical analysis of its structure. It's one of the world's oldest known materials. Professor Graham from the university says zircon has always been the mineral of choice to make measurements that tell you about rocks and samples that have suffered extreme conditions because they are resistant to chemical and mechanical processes that go on deep in the earth. The scientists now want to look at zircon crystals from all over the world to build up a more detailed picture of early conditions at the very birth of planet Earth.
British designers have taken a step into the future. They've created a robotic dog with its very own programmable personality. The high-tech dog is the first stage in developing robots that can be used in the house to carry out domestic duties. His name is RoboDog. He's thought to be the world's largest and most advanced robotic pet. With a video camera for an eye and 16 high-speed motors, this robotic Labrador can do everything from chasing a ball to welcoming you home. The cyber canine is the brainchild of a British team of former Formula One racing designers. They believe it's the forerunner to domestic robots that will one day do your housework and cook your meals. RoboDog can entertain you too with his medley of tricks. Hmm, I haven't been able to get my Labradoodle to do anything like that yet. Linked to a Pentium computer, you can link up and command the dog from wherever you are in the world. It can even see around your house and read your emails back to you. At this demonstration, the prototype whizzed and whirred through its paces, but the designers have promised to find a way to dampen the grind of its motors before a limited edition litter of 200 is delivered to customers. With its carbon fibre coat, the cyber canine may lack stroke ability, but it doesn't leave hairs all over the sofa. The only unfriendly aspect of this dog is the price. RoboDog will set you back £20,000. Of course, you'd save on vet bills. RoboDog says goodbye and thank you for watching me. That brings us to the end of this edition, where we've endeavoured to bring you history-making stories from the world of science. We look forward to your company next time.